Hello and welcome to this uh, second video about Google Analytics XR Obscure Features. And today we're going to talk about caching. And caching uh, is a recent development which um, has definitely sped things up a lot for my workflow. So um, I really hope that you can take advantage of it too. And so caching, um, basically what it does is uh, if you're making a call to the API that you have already done before, in the uh, that R session, then it will instead read it from memory instead of uh, calling it from the API again. And because APIs are way, way slower than uh, doing things on your local computer, then this can be a real significant speed up. Um, so it needs to be exactly the same call, uh, just to make sure that everything's okay. But I'll just demonstrate this. We've got um, this little set of authentication, things like that. And what we're going to do is um, <clears throat> call from my blog in this case. And for the first call, obviously, it needs to call the API. So uh, that's what it's doing now. And if we've got some uh, really long ones, I'll edit those out. But uh, now if we do the exactly the same call again, um, then we can see the difference in time there. And I've added this download time recently to the... So you can see the first call took sort of 12 seconds. But the second tool called to 0.17 seconds. Um, and that's because it's reading it from the memory. Now, by default, it's saving it to the RAM of the R session. So if you restart your R session, then that call is no longer uh, cached. So <clears throat> if I do that again, and then call that again, then it's making another call to the API. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps you want that, but, um, if you want to say, save your caches in between our sessions or even computers and share those files, then, um, you've got this new function called GA cache call and GA cache call, basically you supply it, your, a file location where you want to save these, uh, caches instead of the, instead of RAM, which is the default. So, um, yeah, first of all, you need to, uh, create a folder for that. So I'm going to create GA cache and this is where the files will be kept. And then you just specify the folder there and it will give you true if it's um, been set up correctly and all that. So now if we run that, now every time you use this, you, it resets the cache. So the first one again will um, call the API. So I just see that now. <clears throat> There we go. But then if you do another call here, then um, we can see that uh, we've got another uh, cached call and that took 10 seconds in this case, only half a second in the other place. And if you actually look in this folder, you'll start to see these um, uh, sort of weird looking files and that's, the, that's your API calls and that's what the cache is using to, uh, to cache it. Um, yeah, so now if we restart R, if we do restart our R session, then because uh, if we, as long as we set the same location each time, when we do that, so we'll just load the library and then call, set the same one as we did before. And then if we do the repeated call, we can see that only get these little reading caches messages and that took one second as opposed to um, 12 seconds or whatever it was um, before. Um, and that's because it's reading from this folder. So this can be really, really useful if um, say you're uh, doing R markdown documents, uh, because R markdown documents, usually you're sort of tweaking it and calling lots of uh, uh, reports when you're doing it. And uh, quite often the data is actually kind of static. So instead of say saving that API call to another file and things like that. You can just add a GA cache call at, at the top of your R markdown um, in your setup block or something like that. And then it will always make sure that your files are, and it basically knits those R markdown documents a lot quicker. Um, and the same applies for Shiny as well. You could be um, uh, doing sort of uh, caches in, in Shiny uh, reports, but they have to be exactly the same. Um, now, if you ever want to sort of just reset the cache um, and don't want to read from cache anymore, just to redo that. Um, 
if you want it in RAM, then you'll set it back to as the sort of default. But if you want to set another another folder, you can put it here, or you can just um, either delete that folder entirely if you don't want to cache, or if you want to delete sort of ones in particular, just delete these weird looking files, and that will um, that will do it. So um, now just moving on to sort of some techniques that you can do with this. Um, basically, for big data fetches, this is a, can be, this is where it really starts to become useful because um, so this is a big data fetch I've got here, sort of set up, and I'll edit this out as it gets uh, longer and longer. But um, you, see, you can see it's it's fetching every hour, minute, landing page, and source for this particular website uh, for the last yearish three hundred days, um, and this will take a while because it's uh, downloading uh, 300,000 odd rows, but you can easily get up to millions of rows uh, for bigger websites uh, doing this with lots of campaign sources and stuff. Okay, we're back and we uh, can see that that uh, all in all took uh, about three minutes to uh, download everything, um, but we can see immediately that when we do it again, uh, I won't have to edit the video because um, now we're getting it all in about four and a half seconds. So when you're doing large data fetches, this really starts to come into play. Um, now, um, because we're looking always looking for exactly the same uh, API call to cache it, um, anti-sample when you're anti-sampling should work as well because um, if you're always using the same start date because um, the anti-sample uh, calculations will work from that start date and uh, should be consistent in what days it splits up your call into. So um, that should work exactly the same for that. Um, but um, what you might want to do is actually split out your um, uh, API calls into say monthly chunks and then you can kind of rely on the uh, cache um, t taking the older months, which you know are pretty static, you don't want to sort of change those, and then only make an API call for the most recent month and things like that. So I've got a few sort of demonstration um, functions that will do that, and I've got this off Stack Overflow and things like that, but I'll make this available afterwards as well. So um, these functions here, basically if you pass in a date, then it will create a date range of your uh, months so i've got a demonstration here when we use this function if we use it from the start of 2017 to today then you can see it generates um the start and end of every month as we're going through so and it takes account of leap years i guess and things like that um so there we have like all these sort of convenient things and basically what we're saying is that we would like to cache all of these ones which we know are sort of monthly and fixed Whereas today's the 9th of March, um, we only want to use the API to fetch these this last one for this last month. So um, you can do that. Uh, let's just show you how to uh, demonstrate that. So here we're going to make our uh, date ranges, <clears throat> our month dates, like that. I'll just show you what that is. So this is the table we saw before. And then... Um, I'm going to wrap the Google Analytics uh, uh, call here with that. And what I'm doing is I'm just making a function where we we pass in the start and end date into this function, and then that's used in this Google Analytics. So it's just wrapping us up with all your things that you want, and we're just going to vary the start and end date as we go. And then you can um, basically pass in um, an API call using mApply, and M applies multi uh, argument uh, apply. So it's like L apply and all the other things, like looping and R, you should be using these things. Um, but it will pass in two arguments at the same time. So the first, <clears throat> first argument for M apply is the function that you want to um, pass your variables over. That's the one we just created here. And then we're going to pass in the start dates of the data frame we saw before and the end dates. And then this simplify equals false just prevents it from trying to be clever and changing the data into something you don't want. So I usually use that, uh, key that off. Um, so let's just sh show you what that looks like. <clears throat> I might edit this bit out as well. 
we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> yeah, but you can see basically for each month, it's uh, downloading the data and it takes about seven to five seconds for each month. And obviously this can be a lot more, it'll take a lot longer when you've got uh, a lot of data. But this should do for demo purposes. Okay, so we're back and we can see that we uh, downloaded uh, every month's worth of data and it took roughly about five or six seconds uh, each time. Um, so, but now when we do the that fetch again, then we know that it's going to be reading from cache. So we can see that it all takes uh, a lot quicker. Um, and um, what's going to happen is because we've got this sort of rolling date when we make these date ranges, if we just go back to the start here, uh, we've got this sus date, which will always be today, then that will change the last entry of that. So the last API call will be different each day, but um, so but the rest of them will be cached in the, in the GA cache. When we look at GA cache here, we've got lots of files on here from the monthly fetches. So once you've fetched all of those um, uh, fetches, there will be a list of data frames. Um, if you look at... Uh, this is the thing we did here. Um, so if we look at the class of, let's just look at monthly fetches and then you can max level one. Yeah, so um, you can see this is a list of lots of data frames of things, but because they're all six variables, then you can R bind these pretty uh, easily. Um, and this is a really handy trick to know is reduce, and that applies this rbind function sequentially to every uh, element of a list. In this case, it's lots of data frames. So if we do that, then we end up with all of your data in one uh, data frame. So um, yeah, hopefully that helps uh, and with some uh, techniques. Now we're going to sort of move on to maybe more advanced usage of uh, the caching. Maybe most people won't use this, but um, basically I just want to touch upon it. Um, the reason it works, this is uh, we are using a new feature of, of Google Author, and this is using a library called Memoirs, or Memoirs, or something like that, and. Um, yeah, so if we look at the actual, uh, yeah, if we just look at that function, um, you can see the location here. If it's RAM, then it's just going to do the default. Um, so, but each, um, but then this is the sort of Google Auth uh, uh, function, which um, does the sys, does the business. And um, what you basically have two arguments. One is uh, this mcache, which is a location where you can, uh, set your uh, file system and in this in this case we're doing file system but you can actually set this to Google Cloud Storage or Amazon S3 or even a Dropbox folder or something like that and that means that you can um, cache across computers or teams or something like that because if you're all using the same uh, Dropbox folder say then um, everyone would have access to that and then this invalid function is basically when the uh, caching will apply and caching invalidation is a big subject. This is the default uh, function that is used and it's uh, basically looking for the presence of, is there a report in this v4 API? Um, if there is, then cache it. Um, if there isn't, then do not. Um, and you probably will stick with that for most times, but um, you may want to only cache on certain conditions, say it adds up to a certain number or something like that, uh, that's up to you. So um, I just wanted to mention those two things. If you want to learn more about that, then uh, the website here is uh, Arlib Memois, um, and that sort of goes into details um, about, about that. And then if you're just looking at Google Author, and you look at the website, then we've got um, a lot of talk about how to cache API calls here and things like that. So uh, you can sort of look at that as well. Okay, so um, yeah, hopefully that's of use. And that's the end of Google Analytics while caching. Thank you very much. Bye.